right? Uh, can can you uh, see and, this and one? Uh, yes, and, yes, yes. Yeah. I think okay. you can see the slides. Bangladesh. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so welcome to my small presentation because uh, our time is uh, 10 minutes uh, as I remember. I hope I can finish within 10 minutes. And uh, uh, yeah, I can see. Munir, I have, can you make can you make it full screen? Full screen. Yes. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Now is it there okay? You go. There you go. Sorry for that. No, looks okay. great. Welcome to my presentation and. Um, so uh, this is uh, Munir Ahmed and I'm associated with Sunnet and Basha NGO also for the Lightning team. And I also uh, were happy to be joined with all of you and uh, especially from Bangladesh, five, six persons are supposed to join. I have seen that already, Mr. Omar Farooq, uh, Ms. Kausar Parveen, uh, Professor Akim Saiful Islam already connected and some others also are getting in, I hope so. so uh, in, as introduction, I would like to thank Salnet to arrange such a program and giving us scope to share our work, Department of Disaster Management Bureau. Earlier it was called uh, Disaster Management Bureau, but now it is Department of Disaster Management under the Ministry of Disaster Management and Relief. And they considered uh, lightning as a natural hazard uh, from 2016, which is a good achievement. And uh, with this team, maybe he's, uh, they are also joined already. Thanks to Mr. Abhan Mojumdar, Ms. Kausar Parveen, Dr. Akim Saiful Islam, Mr. Gawar Naim, Ms. Mehrun Nasa Jumur, and others who are joining from Bangladesh part. Thanks to the team members of the Basham who uh, um, supported me. And SSTF, Mr. Rashim Mullah, or Mr. Awal Chaudhary may be connected already. And uh, I uh, would like to go to the next slide. So, as a brief for Bangladesh, recent developments are Bangladesh uh, different television channels started broadcasting awareness tips for lightning safety uh, things. So, so this month I noticed that Bangladesh television, they produced a very nice documentary film and it is quite adequate, I think. And Bangladesh television's Chittagong channel, another channel, they showed as an emergency notice and broadcasted frequently, but that is sometimes like a slideshow. And then another private uh, television channel called NTV, they also go for the another presentation for the public interest. So uh, under the uh, Ministry of Agriculture and Department of Agriculture Extension, Mr. Abahan Mozumdar is leading a project and he's a focal person for establishment of the lightning protection system in our wetland region to save farmers' life pilot project. Because you, many of you know that farmers are most victims in Bangladesh in the open field. And though uh, Bangladesh uh, television channels broadcasted these things are, uh, from this month, but I uh, made an interview uh, uh, on a Akatu TV television channel in 94, uh, 1915, first time. So if you see this slide, it is a little clumsy, but uh, if you see the map, then you can see which are the ma major dominated areas of the how the red circle in the northeast corner covering four or five districts where it is a wetland and dry season, the boro uh, paddy is harvested in May, April, May time. And that time, most of the farmers in the field in open space and thunderstorm and thunder lightning strikes comes and many people died. So in the data is also, if you see the 10 years data, and this data is from the Disaster Forum of Bangladesh. I'm at, uh, uh, indebted to them for this uh, data. And it is, this is published data. According to them, roughly, 3000 uh, in 2018 it was the highest uh, causalities which was 359 and average is 2208 uh, per year so in april in april 2019 in 30 days 21 people died in april to, uh, 2020 in 20 days 57 people died and major districts are kishorgans shunamgans bamunbaria i have already shown in the map by the arrow and the district name as a one Kishorgans district and which are the areas. So this is uh, 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 from there and uh, 
you, see, you can see the how open area petty field harvest in April May that I mentioned. If you see the red mark in the May 15, during 1960 to 2020, 36 cyclones were in Bangladesh and in May it was highest 15. During cyclone also thunderstorm comes. So I'm moving to the next slide. So this is just uh, in one day in 2nd June in 2019, means just one year ago, um, many people died in different districts. I showed the map in red spots where the people died in one day. So now coming to the, uh, as a structured uh, Professor Shiram Sharma preferred for the all presentations that uh, A is the establishment of the respective centers. So in Bangladesh, earlier we had a, a lightning awareness center, but in new form, Basha, within the Basha NGO, 20th October of last year, the inauguration of the uh, Basha Lightning Awareness Center, it was in Dhaka. So after this uh, program, uh, this Basha office has been shifted recently to a new building. Now they have uh, allocated a specific area, specific space for the office for the lightning protection part. So I hope that now it will get a new momentum. So uh, Basha started a lightning safety awareness program several years ago, and they have appointed a focal person, Mr. Shajidul. Uh, one of the relative of Shahjudun got an accident uh, within uh, one and a half hours ago, so he moved to the hospital. Unfortunately, he cannot join, but his uh, colleague, Mr. Omar Farik, is online, I hope. So they have a regular awareness program. So our second uh, uh, slot was establishing relation with their disaster management or risk reduction authority. This area, we are a little lack behind that I admit, but we contacted their director in 2019 earlier and contacted recently also. But due to the COVID-19 situation, we are not under lockdown in Bangladesh now. From first of this month, we are in semi-lockdown stage, but many offices are very strict in the entry of the outsider. So our people uh, uh, tried to make establishment uh, with the sent a letter to the DZ. I'm not sure whether there are any representatives joining today, may, maybe join tomorrow. So coming to the linkage to the government department and other authorities, so, so I mentioned already the Department of Disaster situation, but the uh, Ministry of Agriculture and Department of Agriculture Extension, Mr. Abhavan Mojumdar, who is perhaps connected now, so he's the focal person for establishment of lightning protection system in our region to save farmers' life projects. So this project is very interesting and important to the government and to our all communities who are involved with the lightning protection because farmers are most affected and second is the fishermen. I think this project will cover the fishermen too. So Bangladesh Meteorological Department also key role in the uh, early forecasting and detection of the lightning and uh, Ms. Kausar Parveen is already connected and thanks uh, to her also to join with us with a short notice. and. Uh, I'm not sure whether any person could join from Dhaka University Physics Department. We tried, but due to uh, semi-lockdown stays, universities closed remainly. So I uh, hope maybe tomorrow can join someone. And from uh, our uh, Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology, and famous as a name as Buet. Uh, so from there, Professor Dr. Akim Saiful Islam uh, uh, joined, uh, joined already He's an expert on climate change and lightning related research also. I, I have been involved with him with another research program for five years. So from Disaster Forum, uh, their main person, Mr. Gauhar or Mr. Mehru Nessa, someone maybe might have been connected today or maybe tomorrow. From uh, SSTF, uh, another forum for lightning uh, uh, protection and uh, Awareness, Mr. Rashim Mullah, Mr. Abu, Abdul Awal Choudhury from ETB, he might be already in the connection. So linkage with the other organization association already I mentioned, so I, I would like to not uh, go through this one, but this photograph showing that first meeting with the Basha NGO and the SSTF uh, in Dhaka in last year, uh, and it was, uh, it was uh, good, had the good coverage of the media, uh, in different Bangla and English and newspaper and electronic media. So uh, for as uh, for the 
Basha's part, we are not research organization. So universities are the research organization. Basha is mainly for the public awareness. So you can see a poster. It is in Bangla in the left bottom corner. They produced it with a uh, pictorial pattern and they distributed uh, this poster to their 75 branch offices all over Bangladesh. And the right side, they made a, a flyer type for this event. And Basha will have another program on 28th and semi uh, online and semi uh, some uh, attendance uh, abide by the health precautions as mentioned that way. So research part, we connected uh, or tried to connect some of the uh, in physics professors and teachers in colleges and universities. These are some information how we tried and when we contacted. So this is not very important right now. I skip for the next. Uh, so Basha made some awareness uh, uh, programs in different uh, communities, areas, schools, and other places. I also participated in some of the programs. This is some of the summary of that one. So I skip this slide. Now I'm coming uh, to the part D, awareness raising programs and trainings. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have the, any training program. Maybe with uh, Mr. Gopa Kumar, we had the communication earlier. However, maybe a BASA in next year or maybe after the COVID-19 situation, if it's over, then we may go for the training arrangement. But the, there are lots of awareness programs there. This photograph shows uh, where I was also in that meeting with a uh, college where the girls and boys of the students and the teachers were present. It was on 8th May 2018. And uh, this is the I'm this is nearly the last slide of the uh, my presentation. This is the team of the Basha members, the Akem Saiful Islam. Uh, there are two Mr. Akem Saiful Islam, one is Professor Akem Saiful Islam, who is in line. This is Mr. Akem Saiful Islam, director of Basha, who generously supported the whole program. And uh, Mr. Liton Kumar, Sabrina Ahmed, Mr. Shahjuddin Islam, Mr. Omar Farooq is in the picture. And this is the new office of the Basha NGOs, and they are allocated to space for lightning center and the the meeting room not yet stressed, completed but it is the from the design this will have the provision for the meeting room so we can arrange some programs within the basha office in future so thank you very much uh, for uh, your question hearing and this was all brief about in bangladesh within short time thank you very much uh, thank you dr munir uh, uh, for the uh, precise and uh, short presentation, and that is what uh, we were expecting from you. Uh, now, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Anirvan Gua from Tripura, India. Uh, just a brief introduction of uh, Dr. Gua. Uh, he was the uh, key uh, person to organize uh, the Tripura meeting, roundtable meeting in Tripura that uh, has led to led to uh, establishment of the Solnet. So uh, he is a very, very active researcher. And uh, I think uh, youngest researcher in this uh, Solnet group. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Anirvan to share his uh, experience, share his uh, work that has been uh, being uh, done by himself and uh, his group. Uh, Dr. Anirvan, please share your screen. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Sharma. Uh, is my voice uh, audible? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, uh, so uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, we have been uh, in discussion for uh, this meeting uh, for uh, some time. And, uh, but uh, unfortunately I could not prepare a PowerPoint presentation that I can share. Uh, uh, but I would like to touch upon the five uh, points that uh, Professor Sharma has included in uh, his uh, brochure. So the first point is uh, establishment of uh, the respective centers, which is uh, very important. And then the estab establishing the relation with the disaster management risk reduction authority and collaboration awareness and other activities. So before I start uh, my short speech, because it is only 10 minutes, uh, I would like to give thanks not only to Professor Sharma, but all the Salnet members and all the members who are present in this meeting. I see more than 50 people now present and uh, I welcome them all. I am the, maybe I'm the youngest member. I have lots of things to learn, but I'm learning each and every day. And I would like your suggestions what 
uh, whatever points that I'm going to touch uh, on these five points. So uh, to start with, uh, we have been working on atmospheric electricity in the Department of Physics for uh, more than a decade. Uh, as you know, the topic of atmospheric electricity uh, is a, uh, basically lighting is a branch of uh, atmospheric electricity, but uh, especially in India, what I have seen that uh, people working in this field are very few. Who are working in this field as, are only with their own interest. Even I have seen national laboratories where all the parts of the atmosphere are touched upon except lightning. So when I was a PhD scholar, I decided that we need to not only create awareness, but also create a research environment in which fundamental research on lighting activity should be done. Because the, I believe the, all the components will give us the proper implementation at the societal stage. Uh, so right from the research to its benefit to the society and implementation all depends on different branches. So we decide to stick upon uh, to the research part of this uh, topic. So with that aim, actually, I, I met Professor Chundima Gomes, I think in 2014 in Zambia, where there was a meeting. And then we decided to do something. And as a result of that, in the last year, uh, we inaugurated a Center for Lightning and Thunderstorm Studies, SILS, which was formally inaugurated at the Department of Physics Tripura University on the occasion of roundtable meeting on lightning and thunderstorm, RML 2019. It was held during 12 to 14 September 2019. Um, after the inauguration of the center, we had a meeting at the department to have a formal approach to the University Grants Commission, uh, India, who is the apex body who controls all the universities in our country to have an affiliation. And uh, we are expecting to get all the paperwork forwarded by our competent authority at present. Uh, our new vice chancellor is yet to join. When he joins, and uh, the in charge, uh, whoever is present, said that uh, only when the actual vice chancellor or the new vice chancellor comes into picture, we can forward it to the UGC. So we have completed all the paperwork and we expect to uh, get the affiliation very soon. So, this is the first point that I'm touching upon the establishment of respective centers. So, I am very happy that all of you have supported us very well and I am really grateful for your support. Regarding the second point, establishing relation with the disaster management and risk reduction authority. We are in discussion with officials of the state disaster management authority to prepare an action plan for disaster management as well as risk reduction from lightning. And uh, we, have, we have a running center and we need this, some funding support and we are approaching different uh, funding uh, authorities. And we expect to engage our students with the State Disaster Management Authority to enhance their skills. Because our students at present are not that much of aware how that disaster management they can do. They are mainly academic and research oriented, but I feel that they also should go ahead with that. So we are working upon that. And we, of course, we welcome proposals in the field of, uh, from any uh, salesman stakeholder for a student exchange program. I should mention that, uh, uh, Narayan Prashad Damase from uh, Nepal, under the guidance of Professor Sharma, has already visited our uh, department under uh, a fellowship provided by NAM SNT Center New Delhi for three months. And we already published a paper, and another paper is under review. And this kind of student exchange program, if you want to apply for, we are, we are absolutely open for that kind of student exchange program. So all members, if you feel uh, free uh, to send an email to me, I'll be very happy. The third point is uh, collaboration with other institutes. Uh, we are having active formal collaboration. These are all funded collaborations uh, with MIT, uh, uh, USA and uh, Tel Aviv University Israel. I see Colin is present in this meeting. And we are also going to have a very soon a meeting because we have a bilateral project with Israel also. Apart from this, we have informal research collaboration with several research groups in European countries and China. And we welcome joint research collaborative proposal from any interested Salnet stakeholders. So I also open my invitation. To, uh, if, if any one of you are interested in having any kind of research collaboration proposal, please uh, drop a, an email to me 
and we can definitely work upon that. The fourth point is about awareness rising program and training. As of now, uh, since we are uh, working uh, as a full-time faculty under a university program, as such, we have not yet started any awareness rising program, but our present aim at present is to mainly focus on basic scientific research related to lightning physics. And at present, we are engaging our students on to enhance their necessity, uh, necessary skills in the field of uh, study and application to the society. Uh, we offer a PhD program in this area and welcome applications from aspiring candidates. So uh, that's a uh, fourth point. And the last point, uh, I, I would like to make some announcement on uh, other activities. So first point uh, on the last uh, topic is uh, that we are preparing a website for Salnet with active support from Professor Sharma and Gom. At present, we do not have any funding support. So all the works we are doing are voluntary and in spare time of our daily schedule. So we welcome volunteers primarily from the Salnet core group to nominate at least one volunteer to support us in running the regular activities of Salnet. Second point of the last topic, I would like to announce something here. I would like to inform you that uh, uh, it has been my hobby playing with different kinds of receivers, especially in ELF VLF range. Maybe this triggered my intuition in this research and lightning research specifically. I learned from my experience that the necessary hardware and the software for a VLF receiver may be built with a very cheap but very good quality and with the help of open source code that already available in the internet. Unfortunately, in our country, we prefer to procure maximum research instruments from foreign countries, and this maximizes the research cost significant to a significant amount. So, inspired by this, I thought uh, about it, and throughout the last few years, my team and I have developed a multi purpose VLF receiver primarily for lightning detection in the entire Indian subcontinent. I named it as Indian Lightning Detection Network or ILDN. The funding for this project mainly came from contingencies from existing projects that we have in our department. All are, these are not funded by university, of course. These are all our funded personal projects and donations from some generous people. The specialty of this receiver is we have kept this production cost as much as low as possible compared to procuring from foreign agencies. It is possible since we are not working under a business model. It features a portable antenna and signal processor, low power, no need of a PC, easy to install, rugged hardware, and easy access to data products via source secure mode. The receiver can be programmed to run all kinds of VLF services in a standalone mode like SID detection, whistler detection, fixed frequency transmitter, phase, amplitude logging, and many more, in addition to lightning detection in a network manner. We plan to publish one paper with all the technical details and results. We are at the final stage of the deployment of the network. And I wish to dedicate the service to all the Salnet stakeholders. We are continuously validating the performance of the system. The development of a website of user-friendly data access is also in progress. We received an overwhelming response to installing our sensor from many institutes across the country. After validating the sensor network topology detection efficiency results from computer simulation, we have initially selected 11 sites for the deployment of our sensors under a memorandum of understanding. We are following an open source model for the entire project for the benefit of the scientific community. So there is no cost factor involved if you want to host and have the service of our network, except for if anyone wishes to donate for the regular maintenance of this network, which is entirely voluntary. Your valuable comments and suggestions are most welcome. I think. I have covered my topic within 10 minutes. So here I stop my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Anirban, not only for your wonderful work and tireless effort, but also your generosity to dedicate uh, the uh, research activities to the whole Salnet group, even though it is going to expand in the days to come. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you indeed, uh, Dr. Very. Anirban. Thank you. Uh, it looks that uh, I should uh, present according to the schedule, but uh, I would like to invite a uh, gentleman uh, and a group member from Solnet, uh, and he's from Bhutan, Mr. Parsuram Sharma, he is there. So I'd like to uh, have him here and uh, uh, 
let him tell something, share something from his country. Uh, are you there, Mr. Parsaram? I mean, yes. Good evening. Right? Yeah, good evening. Go ahead, please. Uh, I, I, I have not prepared any presentation for this. I didn't expect to do it. I am a, a teaching faculty in uh, engineering college in Bhutan. It's located at Deotang, which is the eastern part of the country. Hello, am I, yeah, am yeah. I on? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay. And in our in our college, we have around uh, eight, uh, ten programs running. Out of them, seven of them are at the diploma level, and three at the bachelor's level. So, with the inspiration from the Salnet group, we are also thinking of the working with the joining the hands with Salnet to start with the center at Bhutan and look, work at what we can do to promote the safety and precautions towards lighting hazards. And we are, I was just working on this to develop a concept paper for this and start the center. But we have a very tedious process of starting a center at the college. And some of the factors that uh, the, the ender are, we do not have much people with the, uh, what you call expertise in physics. We have some people with the electrical engineering background. So we're trying to work with that. But in the meantime, we, we have a center called uh, Center for Energy Efficiency Studies. So I was thinking that if we could start working as a lightning center, as a component of this center, and slowly once we are able to develop uh, or go ahead a little further, then we could start working for a center separately. So we are just looking at that one. So with this initiative, I also today invited my colleagues to, to attend this meeting and look at the experiences from the other members who are in the Shalnet group and then what, how they are doing, what are the, the activities that have been performed in the, or carried out in different part of the countries. So we, we are today just, we are participating here to learn or to get the experience from the working group, which might motivate us or guide us to go ahead and work with this group and move, uh, push forward the, this uh, work with the lightning awareness, which would be a cause. And I was just browsing down. I, I have not fully finished compiling to see what are the incidences. And we found that many, many of the incidences that occurred with the lightning are not recorded. But one record we, are, we found few annually every year, there are few casualties of human being and the animals, but on the equipment and the appliances and the other property damages they are of the record, they have been, they have not been so much record, but every year we have a lot of damages that are occurring and we informally, we do not have any system to create awareness as well. So we are also thinking that maybe if we are able to go ahead with this one, this would be a useful forum and the beneficial to the community and the people of the country. So maybe I would just stop with that one. Okay? And in here we have uh, lecturers in the electronics and communication engineering department. There's Tandin Yangmo and uh, Isha Shedan, lecturer in electrical engineering department. Yogahari is a teacher in the school in the nearby location. Mr. Vivek Subba is a lecturer in electronics and communication engineering department. Uh, Shrijana Gajmir was to come here. I don't know whether she's here. So we'll be 
taking the experience of today's and tomorrow's meeting and we will be working ahead this and we'll keep in touch thank you for giving me this opportunity to to talk this is uh, just a minute a session for me thank you thank you mr parshuram sharma uh, from bhutan uh, you know uh, mr parshuram that uh, when we were studying in school high school the uh, bhutan was considered to be the country of lightning so i i was thinking that you are getting a lot of uh, uh, you know incidents uh, from lightning but uh, you mentioned that uh, you are having uh, quite a few um, it must be very underrated because uh, if we see the map lightning map uh, then we can find around this uh, bay of bengal there is uh, plenty of lightning activities and of course uh, in nepal we have over 108 people uh, every year significant figure hello must be there. hello hello yes if you If I get time, maybe tomorrow I'll be able to, or sometime I'll just able to give the report what we have got it. But I think, as I said, many are I think off the record. We we have not the many things are not recorded, and maybe because of the scarcity of the the scanty population, the casualties are less could be possible also because the, the mm. there is not very thick population in the areas where it is highly lightning prone areas. Yeah, thank you, thank you, indeed, and uh, we look forward uh, to work together in the days to come, and Salnet will grow stronger. Uh, and now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Nuan uh, from Sri Lanka, the beautiful country, uh, to to uh, give his presentation, uh, what uh, he, uh, their group has been doing, um, and uh, how is the situation in Sri Lanka. Uh, Mr. Nuan, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, cannot uh, start with the video. Uh, is there a problem? I think it should be solved soon. Hello. Yeah, you are there. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sri Ram, my friend, and, uh, and Dr. Mary Ann, and all, and Dr. Sandima. Thank you for inviting me. I just prepared a, a small presentation today. Uh, so my colleague, uh, Mrs. Janaki Athuraliya from Arthur C. Clarke Center, who also shared some slides with me. I uh, let me sh share my screen with you. Yeah, no one. Go ahead, please. Your screen yeah. is yet to come. Yeah, you are there. Okay, sorry for my delay. So this is actually the the Sri Lanka Center for Lightning Protection. Uh, this is a project proposal for setting up the Center for Lightning Protection, Sri Lanka. So, so actually, the before I come to the point. So just I'll briefly explain what is the actual situation in Sri Lanka as far as lightning is concerned. So this I have captured from the database from the Disaster uh, Management Center, which was hosted by the UNDRR, the Inventor Database. So we have noted this is uh, actually the reported death occurrences due to lightning from 1974 until the last year. So you, you can see there's an uh, inclined trend until 2011 and 12, and then after that little bit of uh, the decline in trend is there. Uh, this is uh, we personally believe uh, maybe due to the awareness programs we have conducted several uh, by the several institutions like uh, meteorological department, disaster management center of Sri Lanka, uh, and uh, Arthur C. Clarke Center. 
and also the Sri Lanka Telecommunication Regulatory Commission and also the Environmental Authority of Sri Lanka. So uh, combining all these institutions of Sri Lanka, we uh, managed to conduct all these, uh, say, last de um, decades or so. Uh, and if there are the people, especially the rural area people, and uh, around the country. And this is, uh, and since 2008, and Department of Meteorology start collecting data, this is the, the database they have. Then you can notice near 2011, that is the most reported year, that is uh, of death occurrence due to the lightning. So 51 were reported. And after that, you can, you can find uh, some small uh, reported deaths of, uh, occurred in, uh, since then. And we have developed in 2012 together with the UNDP team. So this is the annual thunder frequency map of Sri Lanka. So there are, there are the red spots are the most vulnerable areas in Sri Lanka as far as lightning uh, strike is concerned. Well, uh, I'll come to the point, the Colombo, this uh, discussion of setting up a, of a lighting center, lighting center in Sri Lanka, as goes back to 2007. Uh, and uh, you all remember, some of you have participated in between, actually this was organized by Dr. Tandima Gomez, uh, mainly, and, and uh, named stake by Dr. Kurasestra, uh, and local authority of Sri Lanka uh, National Science Fund and Technology Commission, NASTEC. And it's in May, 22nd to 25th, 2007. So there, uh, I just want to capture the recommendation, the last recommendation. They say, we further recommend the establishment of an international institute for lightning protection and safety in Sri Lanka in a phased manner, subject to availability of donor funds to address various issues with respect to lightning safety and protection, especially to create awareness among the public about lightning hazards and mitigation measures, and to promote collaboration between the lightning institution in the world signed on 24th of May 2007 in Colombo, Sri Lanka. So since then, the various attempts have made to establish National Center for Light Protection, especially NASTEC took the initial steps. I think Dr. Chandi will remember that we were, we were, he worked very hard to establish this center and Department of Meteorology again started uh, in 2012 after the uh, we had a very good discussion with the Parliament of Sri Lanka also, and but uh, we could not do that. And after that, in uh, last uh, in 2018, Arthur C. Clarke's Institute for Modern Technologies or the Arthur, uh, or ACC, and has taken uh, positive steps to establish Center for Lightning or the CLP. And I'm happy to announce that the Board of Directors of ACC has already approved the proposal in the last year. And uh, cabinet paper has been drafted, and soon after the general election, which is supposed to take place in 5th of August this year, and it will be forwarded to the cabinet. And I hope, uh, and this time, and this uh, will be approved. You can get the cabinet approval. So, what are the main activities and objectives of the proposed center? The, uh, there are various fields, right? You know, research and development mainly. The research on lightning and relevant subjects, development of technological solutions, coordination and facilitation in related research by universities, institutes, and individual researchers in Sri Lanka, research publications and communications. Another aspect is dissemination of knowledge. So, this is the mostly uh, we try to start right from the beginning public awareness programs. Uh, as for now, we, we are conducting, we want to further extend this a training for the engineers, technical professionals, international conferences and symposiums, informing relevant professionals and industrial bodies on the standards, guidelines and good practices, facilitate curriculum development and revision at universities, tertiary uh, educational institutions and schools as well. So policy recommendations are to be developed in compliance with the Sri Lankan, Sri Lanka's uh, legal framework. Then this has to be developed further. And consultancy and services, providing consultancy on lightning protection 
13 to the public sector, the private sector, and general public. And also providing performance testing facilities for the industry, earth resistance, soil resistance measurement, etc. And commercialization is uh, of research and development output. These are the most important things because if we do many research work, but if we don't get the commercial output product, it won't uh, be a, a positive thing. So we have a uh, uh, plan to conduct internal R&D outputs and collaborative R&D outputs also, internal as well as with the collaborative ones. So entrepreneurship and employment generation, that's another aspect we are going to touch. The facilitation of small and micro level entrepreneurs at the local level to provide lightning protection services by providing them with training and certification. This is, I would just want to expand because there are more than 6,000 uh, communication towers uh, and mushrooming all over Sri Lanka. And they need, as for our uh, Sri Lanka's Telecommunication Regulatory Commission's uh, guideline, we want to at least check one test to be conducted every year to pass their uh, uh, certificate. So to do that, we have a lack of technical personnel. So the center will take care on training them and educating them and issue them a certificate. So, uh, and providing technical training to school leavers, unemployed personnel to be qualified to carry out earth resistance and soil resistivity measurement at sites. Engagement of such other external networks as we have uh, centers called Vidata, which is which belongs to Science and Technology Ministry, and community-based organizations to provide equipment or facilities, thereby devising mechanisms at the local level. And before I uh, end up, uh, let me uh, happily introduce uh, two colleagues actually right now. So they are with me, uh, apart from uh, Mrs. Jani Kiaturulia. And uh, one Dr. Uh, Sarat Premalal is the former Director General of Meteorology and he was the former Secretary General of uh, Association for Disaster Risk Management Professionals or so ADRIP. And he is a very active member as well. And uh, he is joining with us. Uh, I welcome him. And uh, Dr. Chandana Sirwardana, he is the present Secretary to ADRIP. He both I welcome on behalf of our Sunnet. And thank you very much for you all. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Nuwan. And I would like to uh, welcome both Dr. Chandana and uh, Dr. Premlal on behalf of Solnet as well. Uh, I won uh, both of you. Uh, now, uh, although it's uh, my turn to present uh, uh, the development in Nepal, but I would like to skip it because we are lagging behind the time. So I would like to invite Professor Marianne uh, uh, from USA and uh, director of uh, ASLNET, African Center of Lightning Electromagnetic uh, Research. So I would like to invite her and she is the uh, one of the uh, co-organizers of this uh, meeting. Uh, Professor Marianne, are you there? Okay, could you please uh, Share your, yeah, uh, share your presentation or whatever you have. Professor Marian has been working in the um, uh, field of lightning safety awareness for more than two decades. And she is a medical doctor by profession uh, from the beginning, but she has been working with lightning, uh, uh, treatment on lightning injuries and all for several years. She would like to, I think, uh, share her experience uh, with the, all the people here. So uh, I would like to welcome Professor Marianne again. Please uh, do share your screen. Thank you. Can you see the shared screen? Because I can. Yes, I can see your screen. And, okay, uh, very good. Okay. So well, we, can only see, we can see you, not your, share, not your screen. Okay, maybe uh, let me try again. Yeah, you have to share the screen, yeah. Yes, I have been doing that, but there we go. Yeah, coming up. Okay. Yeah, yeah now we see it. And full screen. Yeah. 
Yeah, we've practiced everyone else, but we haven't practiced me. <laughs> so, okay, can you see it now? Yeah. Yes. Okay, very good. Let's see, I can't see it. Okay. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me, uh, Sri Ram, and thank you so much for organizing a conference like this. This is just, this is a dream come true after working in lightning safety for 20, 30, almost 40 years now to see this many people interested and this many people uh, working so hard to save lives. Um, I'm a professor at the, I retired from the University of Illinois uh, nearly 10 years ago, and I've been working with the uh, African Centers for Lightning and Electromagnetics ever since. Well, since 2011, when I met Richard in, uh, at the Nepal conference. So again, thank you to Solnet and everyone for um, putting on this conference. This is amazing. Um, you know, uh, as a doctor. Presentation mode, uh, Marianne. What's that? Presentation mode. Of, of your okay. PPT. Yeah. Now, can you see it better? Uh, no, that's now presentation mode. Maybe just F5. F5. And go back to the previous version. Hmm. Are you using two screens? Yeah, I'm using two screens so the mouse gets away from me. Okay, so here we go. From here, can you do F5 now? Okay. You can use the reading mode, Marianne Cooper. There you go. Hmm. It's still back in uh, two screen mode. If you exit, use the reading mode. I can't understand you, Dyla. Um, so exit, uh, you are, you're not using the reading mode. So go to the third one, not the fourth one, the third. Yes, that's okay. There? Yeah. Better. Okay. Better. Yeah. I apologize. I should have been rehearsing myself as well as is. Uh, um, oh, please go ahead. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, so let's move forward. So thank you. Um, as a physician, I treated lightning and electrical injuries for many years and found that there was very little that we could do for people after they were injured. And so I came to the thought that it's far better to prevent lightning injury than to care for the survivors and the families afterwards. And that's when I started doing lightning injury prevention. And I was lucky enough to meet Ron Holly, my partner in so many of these um, uh, endeavors. You know, lightning, I want you to think about this. Lightning is the most commonly encountered weather threat to the life of most people. Now you may think about tsunamis, but how often do they happen? You may think about floods, how often do those happen? But people, certainly during their rainy seasons, see lightning um, sometimes daily. So it's the most commonly encountered weather threat to life for most people. Now it's not moving forward. But you know, when we're talking about raising awareness, we don't really have to do it with the most vulnerable people. For most of them, they're already aware of the danger. The problem is that they don't have the knowledge or the resources to prevent the injury to themselves and their families. So what we need to do uh, as lightning people is give them these resources uh, and give them the knowledge so they understand what is happening when lightning comes through. Knowledge is the key. Public education uh, should include, uh, we need to do public education, we need to educate our colleagues, we need to educate our neighbors, but certainly we need to do public education by providing lightning safety in school curricula. Uh, we've got puzzles, games, lightning drills, all kinds of things like that that we can uh, share with our colleagues around the world. Certainly when uh, lightning incidents come up, take advantage of the crises make yourself the expert with the TV and the radio and the other media in your area. Uh, in Africa, we've done newspaper inserts on the science of lightning and lightning protection and 
at the common level, you know, at, at a readable level, not at the science level. Public service announcements, you may have spokespersons that are popular in your countries. Use them to deliver the message. And certainly, I'm not an expert in social media, but there are a lot of our younger colleagues who are, who can spread this through all the smartphones and get it out to people. And then in the communities, you can use elders um, to educate the children. Work with community leaders, the head teachers at your schools, coaches. Um, for the non-literate, street theater has been done before, songs, storytelling, all kinds of things. And then there's the science documentaries. Uh, there's a lot of myths about lightning. We have to counter those respectfully. Now, when you talk to the media, this is the perfect media story. It doesn't matter what direction they look at lightning, whether it's from the beauty, from the science side, which you all can give them, from the aspects of the injury, if they want to cover people who have been injured and, and what it's done to families, uh, all of the things that it interferes with, sports, recreation, there's tragedy involved, there's hope involved, there's injury prevention. And then when you talk to the media, I always, always say, your story will save lives. Media people are not used to hearing that they're going to really make a difference, but you can tell them they will save lives because their stories will. That's how we've gotten the message out in the United States. There's some barriers to education in all of our countries. First of all, the cost of producing materials. Uh, but if you do TV, uh, that doesn't cost you anything, okay? There's a lack of trainers and teachers. Uh, certainly there's problems, electricity, internet, cell towers, people keep coming in and dropping out of this because of this meeting because of connectivity. There's dealing with multiple langu languages, the people who can't read, and then the isolation of the rural population who may be dispersed, um, hard to reach in uh, distant areas, and refugees, which I think we've all forgotten. Okay, so what should the content of your message be? Well, we started out with, these are refrigerator magnets that sit up on your refrigerator. And see all that material? Well, come on, you know, it's all, don't stand under a tree, don't do this, don't do that. Don'ts don't help anyone, so don't teach the don'ts. Teach the do's, teach simple, short messages that people can remember. In the United States, three-year-olds can remember this when thunder roars go indoors. They may not remember the exact words, but they know when they hear thunder, they're supposed to go inside. Be creative. One of the things we're doing with Africa is trying to come up with signage that says the things that we need to communicate to people so that even the people who can't read can understand it. What does this cartoon say to you? If any of you want a copy of this, please let me know. We'd love to have you copy it out, show it to your kids, show it to your next door neighbor, show it to your colleagues and say, what does this mean? Well, what it's supposed to mean, and we may just end up using this last um, uh, corner down in the right lower corner. It's when thunder roars, go indoors. Simple for the non-reader, okay? Now let's talk about the resources. We talked about the education, talk about resources. Resources for people, the only lightning safe places in uh, our communities are substantial buildings, those with plumbing and wiring in the walls. Well, how many of us have those, uh, particularly in the developing country? We're talking about um, mud walls and thatch roofs in Africa. So they don't really have a safe place to go. Okay? The other second place is an all enclosed metal vehicle. Well, how many of those of us have those in our communities too? So we're going to have to come up with other suggestions and other things to tell people for them to get to safety. One of the things that Ron and Holly and I did, uh, we've written everything that's in our brains, it's in this book. So this book uh, is for graduate students on research, uh, questions that still need to be answered. It talks about raising uh, awareness. It talks about forming national centers. I've posted it so that it's free up on my research gate so you can get every penny, every uh, word that way without having to pay for it. Ron and I don't make any royalties. Uh, we've already been paid our thousand dollars divided between the two of us to write the book. You can get it at Springer for uh, download by chapter or uh, you can get it at Amazon too if you want a hard copy. But um, 
hopefully this will help with a lot of ideas as well. Other resources, the NOAA, uh, the USA NOAA site, which I'll be happy to give you the link to. Uh, links don't work very well on um, uh, these kinds of programs. They have science, weather information, they have all those puzzles and games, curricula for all ages. It's all free. You can download all of it. In addition, this National Lightning Safety Council is those of us who have graduated or retired uh, from the NOAA team. Uh, we have many of the materials on the Lightning Safety Council website as well. Uh, ACLE Net will help you customize it, uh, any of the materials to your country so that you have the faces of your kids in your countries in here, not just US faces. And don't forget all the resource people from this conference. Let me volunteer all of us. And, and uh, if that's not, not okay, you can come after me. But I say we're all available. Certainly I am available all the time. Don't forget to have fun with this. Uh, you, can, um, you can meet wonderful people in the Lightning community. I left uh, medicine because I like the people in Lightning so much better. So if you have any questions, if you ever need anything, I'm always available. Thank you very much for inviting me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Marianne. Wonderful sharing your experience all the way from the United States. And uh, yeah, of course, encouraging all the people uh, in the, in the, in the uh, meeting. Now I can see uh, uh, Mr. Ron Hool, uh, the senior scientist from Vaishala, detecting, counting on lightning strokes and uh, uh, doing all the meteorological researches and all. He has been doing plenty of research on lightning casualties and fatalities around the globe. And this gentleman uh, is the one who could uh, figure out uh, the number of total casualties uh, around the globe due, <coughs> due to lightning as much as 24,000 per year. So please welcome uh, Mr. Ronald uh, for his uh, presentation. Uh, Mr. Ron, you are there so you can share your screen. You are very much welcome here. All right, thank you. Well, thank you, Sri Ram. It's good to hear your voice again. Um, I'm speaking again tomorrow, so today is a little bit more of an overview of who I am. That's what you asked for. And um, I should point out that uh, I'm in Arizona, and let's let, we have had a forest fire burning because of lightning in the mountains about 15 kilometers from us for three weeks uh, now, Tom tomorrow will be three weeks. So this was the view at sunset. It has not damaged any buildings and there's been no injuries. However, it has devastated the forest over a large um, mountain range just, just near us. So it's been pretty ugly and scary and disappointing to see it. So anyway, I'm, I'm in Arizona in southern, southwestern US in, uh, in Tucson. <coughs> few things about where I come, come from. As you said, I'm a senior scientist at Weisla here in Tucson. Uh, previously, I was with the NOAA Research Laboratories in Miami, Boulder, and Norman. If you're a meteorologist, you know those places. Um, I'm a co-founder of the Lightning Safety Awareness Week that Marianne and I were involved in back uh, 20 years ago. This is the 20th anniversary. And as she mentioned, the, the book, um, we published uh, a couple of years ago. And I'm also on the board of directors and executive committee for the African Centers for Lightning and Electromagnetics Network, ACLE Net. And I published a few things here and there. About two thirds of this is probably lightning. So let's talk about the end to end war light lightning warning process. We'll talk more about this tomorrow, but I wanted to introduce these ideas. The first thing is you need to identify a lightning safe place in advance. What if you don't have such a place? Well, that's a problem. All the rest of the steps don't work if you don't have a lightning safe place to go to. If you do have one, then you can use reliable and accurate lightning data from a network. You need to have a way for the data to reach the person in a timely manner. In a scale of thunderstorms, you're down on the 
seconds to minutes at most. Then you need to um, provide the data to the people or the facilities that are at risk. Then you go to, people go to a lightning safe place and then stay there until the lightning is cleared. And that's an important part of the process also. So this is the, the process and all the steps in between need to be taken to make a complete uh, process. Um, in terms of lightning detection, Vaisala has this global network. It's been out for a number of years. This is a five-year average, over 2 billion, with a B, 2 billion events detected every year. And we can see the fairly well-known uh, locations, mainly over land. And uh, let's see, yes, I have a blow up here of Southeast Asia. You can see the maximum. I've done some studies with uh, people in uh, Bangladesh. There really is a maximum in Northeastern Bangladesh there, but also, <clears throat> As a meteorologist, these are really interesting situations because we have mountain ranges on islands surrounded by warm equatorial water. So there is a lot of lightning added near these locations. The US National Lightning Detection Network has been in operation for over 30 years. And it has, uh, last year, when you count both cloud to ground strokes and cloud lightning, we had a quarter of a billion events over the US. So lightning detection is a pretty mature technology with a long history of um, verification in the literature. It's a global network, like I showed, there's regional ones like uh, Southeast Asia, there's national ones, and there's local ones for that matter. And forest fire detection is very important. The fire that I showed you that's burning out just to the east of us was detected very accurately by the US network within 150 meters. Um, other applications are power utilities and meteorology and aviation and verifying damage for insurance claims is a very big uh, topic. <clears throat> a lot of geophysics are interest, people in geophysics are interested in lightning for a lot applications of upper atmosphere as well as global uh, NOx production and so on. And what, are, what does the Lightning Network do? The context of this, space, this uh, conference is safety. So you can get lightning rates. Is it increasing or decreasing? What's the density over a long period? What's the polarity and the signal strength? And what's the, uh, which ones are cloud to ground and which ones are in clouds? So these are data from the US National Network. Detects over 90% of cloud to ground flashes. 50% uh, or more of in-cloud lightning, median <clears throat> location accuracy is 150 meters. And the lightning type is um, correctly identified 90 95% of the time. And the alerts are sent out within 15 to 60 seconds, depending on various factors. So let's consider, I'm just about done here, the uh, situation of agricultural workers in a developing country. How do they receive the data in a timely matter, manner. How do they react to the threat? They need to go, know where to go to be safe. There just needs to be a lightning safe structure in the field. One possibility is to provide buses or other vehicles to be out in the field during the day when people are out in the working. Who decides when to stop? And really an important issue is there a penalty for not working when lightning is a threat? <clears throat> I'm seeing a lot of agricultural workers in, uh, <clears throat> in developing countries will keep working because it's their livelihood and it's also cooler when it's raining. So how do we handle that threat? And again, the end to end process is to identify a place and provide good data, receive the data, provide the data to the people who need it, go to a lightning safe place and stay there until it's cleared. So we'll talk more about this tomorrow. And that's it, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Ron for your presentation. Uh, by the way, uh, 
how our young students and uh, researcher can share or exchange the data from Vaishala so that they can do the research on. So that is my question. Uh, and by the way, um, I would like to um, ask uh, my friends and uh, all the participants to uh, drop your questions, queries on the chat box so that uh, we can, a uh, concerned person can ask at the end or answer at the end. Uh, Ron, how can our students can uh, avail your data and all? Well, I, uh, I manage the program within Vaisla for providing free lightning data. We do have a process that's fairly uh, formal in terms of area and time and limitations and so on. However, we do provide data for areas for time up to five years and up to, uh, let's see, 700,000 square kilometers. That's just a, a limit that we put in to keep it within a reasonable limit. So you can contact me and we can proceed from there. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you so much. Shri, you're mu muted. If you're speaking, we can't hear you. There you go. Okay, somebody muted me. Uh, Mr. Kumar Maragasan uh, from Earth Network. I would like to invite you if you are there. Mr. Kumar. Are you there, Mr. Kumar? No, then uh, I should go for the next speaker. It's uh, Mr. Gopakumar, MD, Cape Electric India. Mr. Gopakumar, are you there? Yes, uh, Miram, are, am I audible? Yes, uh, we can hear you. So please uh, share your am I uh, presentation and go ahead with your uh, presentation. Uh, Sriram, can you hear me? Yes, we do. We do. Yeah. Please go ahead. Uh, in between, my speaker was not working. Okay. okay. So, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Sriram, and all the friends and colleagues uh, across the globe. So, this is our second meeting, maybe after uh, the Tripura event a uh, few months back. And it's, it's good that, uh, you know, we are, uh, instead of uh, keeping our meeting pending, we are doing something. Uh, so I would like to show you uh, some of the uh, achievements which we made a few in the last few years. Uh, one moment, let me share the screen. Yeah. So first of all, I would like to show you, I'm sure you are able to see the screen of LARC, Lightning Awareness and Research Center. Uh, this is an answer to the, uh, the question which Anirban uh, asked. <clears throat> so we created LARC during 2006 in Trivandrum. This was under the, uh, the guidance of uh, an organization, an NGO, CISA, but uh, we started the activities during 2006 uh, with a lot of awareness programs. So during these years, I would say we must, we, we have made in last 14 years, we conducted at least uh, 150 programs, especially the uh, lighting awareness programs across the state, across South India. Uh, in fact, we also made one in 2007 in Bangladesh uh, with uh, Munir and his team in Chittagong. Uh, Parallelly, we were doing a lot of awareness activities, uh, and in 2014, we shifted the focus towards the school. Uh, there was a massive awareness uh, class which we conducted for schools across uh, the state, 
and there were uh, i think about 65000 children participated about 6500 teachers were educated so we prepared the uh, the the videos for the teachers in local language we had the brochures for example uh, then we uh, also had a blog this was our official blog which we were keeping active since several uh, several years so there were uh, you know a lot of questions daily and we were trying to answer the answers especially during the monsoon time during may june and uh, so on there were people used to ask uh, what we need to do and what we need not so we were doing a lot of such activities uh, and the uh, biggest achievement which we made is uh, the uh, national uh, you know the the disaster uh, management authority uh, in kerala state uh, about two months back they announced that the number of deaths in the state of kerala has reduced from uh, 70 a decade back uh, to something about four in the last uh, consecutive four years 2016 17 18 and 19 they they recorded the number of deaths were uh, just uh, Uh, less than four uh, so this i would say uh, personally this was a big achievement because we were running uh, behind a lot of activities uh, spending lot of money the the one which uh, is uh, shown here which i am sharing the screen this was workshop on hazard of lightning and protection strategies for kerala 2014 this was inaugurated by the then chief minister of the state chief minister means the head of the state uh, who inaugurated and we conducted this in a big way across the state during that time so however i am i am happy that the the uh, the works which we did has made a lot of improvements and you know a lot of uh, uh, this was the the report which we made uh, you can i can show you some of the pictures so uh, this uh, p- this was uh, i remember this was shared to the this was shared uh, uh, to all our friends circle a few years back uh, so uh, i would like to tell you that we had we did a lot of work uh, across uh, india but uh, mostly we were focusing on the south india Uh, but now our focus is a little bit uh, uh, towards the other parts of india in between we also prepared this particular book which you can see this was a, <clears throat> a book which is explaining as uh, mary ann told what the do's and don'ts we tried to include uh, you know do's and don'ts with some kind of uh, simple pictures in this uh, in this uh, book this was a uh, uh, very much useful uh for uh, the children or uh, for the school children at that time probably you know the boy who is uh, sitting here uh, this is ashen uh asita asita asmita rule tina lada so this was hello i hope you, you can hear me yes <clears throat> but now in the last uh, uh, one or two year we are seeing a, a kind of a, a change in the situation we were putting a lot of efforts in the correct way in the right way uh, in building up the knowledge in the public but uh, in between last 6 uh, months we could see that a new lightning protection system which i am showing in the picture this is like a, a wooden pole with a cycle tube at the a cycle uh, you know the tire at the top uh, somebody made this kind of a system and they are installing it in uh, schools and uh, public places uh, you can see this was uh, uh, i took it from a website uh, which, is, which they claim that they are getting support from uh, the uh, the ngos or they are getting support from the uh, social uh, uh, funding of the big corporate companies and they are in- installing this kind of lightning protection this they claim which will pro- this is protecting an entire village uh, uh, don't ask me how it protects i i also don't know but this kind of propaganda things are going on in india 
uh, even though we are putting our uh, right efforts in the our efforts in the right way to educate the people but uh, uh, you know it is often uh, our our efforts are beaten up by uh, these uh, non scientific uh, uh, you know lightning protection system so in this particular case what we did is uh, we three of us uh, joined together myself uh, dr nagabhushana uh, you must be aware of uh, dr nagabhushana he is the former professor and chairman of high voltage engineering department of indian institute of science uh, and dr pradeep kumar dikshit uh, uh, three of us uh, we have made uh, a letter and we started circulating in the, uh, uh, in, the in the in the national disaster management groups of uh, the government of india uh, uh, to several state governments and tell them that uh, Uh, because this is mostly promoted by the national disaster uh, the state disaster management groups <clears throat> uh, mostly these uh, things these these wooden pole and the cycle tube technology lightning protection these are used in the uh, villages of uh, the the areas very close to bangladesh uh, in the eastern part of india <clears throat> which uh, mr roland told the the number of lightning strikes are much more in this particular area i would i feel that this is really danger however we are trying our best to 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 uh, make people aware of such disasters so this was one of the website the lightning council uh, which was making the propaganda saying that uh, this uh, uh, you can see they made a, a study monsoon 2019 how many people died according to them thousands of people are dying in india and uh, finally uh, they put this uh, magic uh, stick and the cycle tube uh, as the protection uh, method they claim that they have made a lot of lightning awareness classes in india but practically i i didn't see any of uh, such classes <clears throat> so this is uh, uh, what is happening unfortunately in our country then uh, this uh, particular news this is a news in the local language uh, malayalam which is uh, you know in the south indian state of malayalam which says uh, the lightning strikes the deaths due to lightning has been reduced from 72 to less than 4 uh, due to the mass awareness programs which has been conducted during the last uh, one year so also uh, i would like to show you the one of the uh, you know the two days workshop which we did in uh, bangladesh during 2007 so this was the two days workshop uh, in bangladesh uh, at chitagong which we did in 2007 uh, maybe munir uh, is uh, very well maybe you can call back what has happened uh, during these days uh, we also uh, are keeping uh, posters we are preparing posters like this one this is especially this is exclusively made for schools uh, one in english but we also prepared in something about uh, seven different languages uh, across uh, you know and distributed this in the local schools uh, just to be aware this is one of the style or one of the poster but we also prepared a lot of uh, other posters as well uh, and uh, finally we have uh, the construction industry engineering part of lightning protection we uh, the national building code of india last year 2017 when it is published we made a, an innovative method uh, we made as a, a chart like this uh, which offers for example for a small building what kind of protection is required for example building with no steel reinforcement foundation but with uh, electricity connection so you need to make an spd and ringer thing Uh, and then you know for a different kind of building these uh, kind of buildings 1 2 3 4 up to 7 these are the classifications as per the national building code of uh, india so for each kind of building what the minimum uh, protection measures are required these are included in the national building code and nowadays uh, people make use of it and uh, for your information the uh, one of the evil in the market with respect to lightning protection what is the 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 early streamer emission and the dissipation array system these people were uh, making propaganda propaganda of you know early streamer emission devices absorb lightning and it send the lightning to the ground without uh, creating any problem so we were fighting against this and to some extent uh, the the, uh, the national regulator or the national building code of india they have written that uh, the such kind of non standard systems uh, shall not be accepted uh, in india so anyway this is uh, going to give a good uh, impression in the market 
Now, uh, tomorrow we are going to have the national uh, electrical safety, the first national electrical safety week. Uh, so inauguration of this week, and I am going to publish the book which I have shared in the uh, our group, uh, you know, two days back. Uh, the book name is uh, The Missing Link. Uh, this is about the uh, electrical safety, the missing electrical safety subjects in the low voltage engineering part. So these are the activities uh, which we are uh, doing. And uh, finally, I, actually I prepared a presentation, but uh, uh, somehow it uh, went to the other side. Yeah, according to the media, thousands of uh, uh, lightning accidents are happening in India and a lot of people are uh, dying, thousands of people are dying. But uh, nowadays I would see that uh, most of the accidents are uh, combined with uh, thunderstorm and the lightning. So there are news that suddenly we get the news that 150 people died due to thunderstorm and lightning. But once when we go into deep into the uh, news, it says mostly people are okay. It was a, a, a thunder shower along with a thunderstorm. Basically, people are dying not only because of lightning but uh, because of other uh, things as well. Uh, so as a result, you know the correct data of. Uh, how many people are getting affected due to lightning? It's very difficult to get the correct data at the moment in India. So the regions here I have mentioned, you can see the, the cursor, especially the southern, co the, the eastern coast of uh, uh, the state called Andhra Pradesh. Uh, this state the last two years uh, have recorded, you know, uh, more than uh, 70 to 80 deaths uh, due to lightning in this area and the other circle uh, the, the the state called uttar pradesh and the madhya pradesh this particular area uh, last two years the the recorded deaths due to thunderstorm uh, is uh, not only lightning during this this uh, time uh, this was about uh, 1500 it's not a small number it's a quite huge number so by this i would like to stop uh, my presentation uh, thank you very much, uh, Sharma and all the colleagues uh, for, for uh, uh, you know, then again the picture, uh, maybe a much better picture about the cycle tube, uh, the new uh, system. So on the right side, you can see on the left side, this particular photo, this is an installation. It is in a school or in a hospital in a, in a rural area. And the right side, this uh, photograph, uh, students of an university standing uh, behind this particular uh, wooden pole, which is called as the lightning protector, which is going to save the entire village. Uh, so unfortunately, if a lightning hits, uh, all the people, those who are uh, under this uh, wooden pole will be in trouble. Okay, anyway, so by this, uh, I would like to stop. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sri Ram and all the colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Gopakumar, for this uh, presentation and uh, yeah, sharing uh, such uh, magical instruments uh, that uh, is becoming viral in the, in the eastern part of India. Perhaps they will come to Nepal as well. So let's uh, be aware of uh, such uh, such uh, gadgets. And uh, I have seen so many um, such gadgets uh, actually uh, um, some proponents are there in Nepal, Nepali market, who are selling uh, such gadgets, though much fanciful, but I am not sure if they are working or not. Anyway, and also, Mr. Uh, Gopakumar, if uh, the uh, book you mentioned is uh, available, uh, I would like to see it if you can share with us. Yeah, I can uh, share it. Uh, if you want, I can show it now. One moment, please. But maybe if if you if someone can continue so that I will open it in the PDF format and open it maybe uh, after the next presentation that would be fine. Sure, sure, sure. Next, yeah. Now next, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Colin Price uh, uh, from Israel, Tel Aviv, Israel. Uh, he, the Professor Price, uh, has been working with lightning and uh, climate change particularly for um, I think more than two decades and uh, is a very prominent uh, person in this uh, field. Uh, and if there is anything in this field, lightning, climate change, uh, and uh, future climate, we, uh, he is the one who uh, is answering all our queries and all. So uh, I would like to welcome Professor Colleen uh, to, to 
give his presentation. Uh, Professor Corlin, please share your screen and go ahead. Uh, thank you. So thank you, Shiram, um, for also inviting me. I'm very happy to be part of this uh, <clears throat> this community now. Uh, I I just met many of you at the meeting in Tripura last year as a result of a joint project I have with Anirban uh, and some basic research also related to thunderstorms. Um, so most of my research, for those who don't know me, I'm a professor in Israel at Tel Aviv University in the geophysics department and I uh, focus on atmospheric electricity, lightning, also fair weather electricity and many other areas. Um, but one of my main focuses are actually uh, climate and how climate change may be impacting thunderstorms and lightning. Uh, and today I'll talk a little bit about the, the past and tomorrow I'll talk about the future. Um, both of these are fairly uncertain, uh, the data. Um, we, we heard from, uh, uh, from Ron Holly that uh, there's very beautiful data today of lightning, but we don't really have very long time series uh, going back in time, maybe 20 years, but not global. Um, satellites haven't been really monitoring continuously. And so we don't really have a lot of information about uh, whether lightning is changing or thunderstorms are changing in the past. And therefore we have to try to think of how we can actually estimate this by uh, using other, other means. So um, the, what I'm going to be showing here in my talk is, a, is based on a uh, a uh, paper published recently, Journal of Climate 2020, uh, one of my graduate students, Mayan Harel, where we try to develop a means of simulating over Africa the changes in lightning or in, in thunderstorms, not necessarily lightning. But before we go there, um, I'll mention that one of the ways that we can try to <clears throat> see whether thunderstorms are changing over, the, over 100 years, decades, is to look at a parameter which has been measured over many uh, decades, <clears throat> even century, um, uh, which is called thunder days. Now, what's thunder days? Thunder days is actually the number of days that you can hear thunder. And uh, before we had lightning detection networks, um, weather observers at various meteorological stations and uh, uh, offices around the world, one of the parameters that they would mark down every day is whether they'd heard thunder. Now, this doesn't mean doesn't really depend on whether it's one crack of thunder or a hundred in the same day, it's still one day of thunder. So you can have a maximum of 30 days maybe um, in a month and the maximum obviously 365 in a year. And so these data are somewhat subjective to the observer, if he, how his hearing is, and you can normally hear thunder up to about 20 to 30 kilometers away from the actual lightning. If it's further than that, the sound waves will be refracted up and you won't actually hear the thunder. Um, and here you can see, for example, of uh, Brazil um, data from 1950 showing the number, of, this is the thunder days per year. So the maximum is 365. And we're seeing going from about 60 days in the year with, with thunderstorms up to maybe closer to 90. So uh, a significant increase if we look at the temperatures for the same region, here too, there seems to be a, a small but significant increase over the 50 years from 1950 to 20, and giving a sense to have about a 10% change for, uh, in thunder days for every one degree warming in that region. Um, so this has been looked at a number of different places. Here you can see similar plots for Alaska, Southeast Australia, um, Japan, and, uh, I'm picking out some of the, the significant increases. There are many places which don't show changes in thunder days and even some places which show decreases. But we do see some places where we have significant increases <clears throat> over the 20th century. There's a lot of scatter here. And again, um, it depends on where you're observing and who's observing and the changes of the observers. So there are some problems with this data, but it's really the best data we have when we're looking at long-term changes in the past of thunder, thunderstorm activity. Well, to try to improve this, <clears throat> we've been uh, developing a new method. Obviously, a, uh, I don't have to explain to any, anyone why we want to do this and why it's important to be actual, to, to understand the long-term changes uh, linked to deaths, injuries, 
uh, rural communities are particularly vulnerable. Uh, we don't have any historical records, so we would want to look at some proxies. Uh, tropical Africa was the focus of our study, but we're now moving also to look at other areas, uh, Southeast Asia and South America. Um, and so what did we do? We basically uh, said, well, we've, if we take the lightning data, can we relate this to various large scale climate parameters? So on the left is the, the climate data that we use. This is the, what's called the NCEP, uh, NCAR reanalysis. So this is a, a data product which combines model, but also data when it's available and forces the model to match um, the data where we have the data. And so this gives us a fairly good estimate of the weather, the situation uh, on every day from 1948 until the present at every six hours, I think on a 2.5 degree uh, grid resolution, which is about 250 kilometers by 250 kilometers. So at every six hours from 1948, we have estimates over the whole globe of temperature, specific humidity, lifted index omega, all the different parameters related to the atmosphere. So we wanted to see if some of these are related actually to lightning activity, but lightning activity, as I've just mentioned, we have problems and also the networks um, as Ron will also, will also uh, say, are being improved all the time. So if we adding new sensors to our network every year, uh, changing our algorithms, we may actually see more and more lightning being detected, but actually in reality, we're not having more lightning, we're just detecting it better. So we use this, this uh, network called Woolen, the Worldwide Lightning Location Network, it has about 70 VLF stations around the globe, detects mainly the cloud to ground lightning, uh, works on a time of arrival algorithm, which we don't have to go into. <clears throat> and we have data from 2004, uh, 2004 to today, although it gets better with time, which is a problem, getting better resolution. Um, and we built our uh, empirical model uh, based on the climate parameters and the lightning data for the data from 2013, tested it on 2014, and then I'll show you what we did with that afterwards. So for those not familiar, the Woolen Lightning Detection Network is made up of these about 70 stations shown by these little red stars in the, in the circle. Um, we also have a few in India and ours here in Tel Aviv. Um, and this gives us the detection of lightning shown here um, in the blue dots. And I think you can see the website at the bottom here. You can go in and see more or less real-time global lightning. Uh, although again, we're only seeing part of the cloud to ground not like the GLD 360, um, and, but you can see this detection, which is shown by these little colored dots on the map. Another student of mine, Karen Mazuman, developed a, a clustering algorithm that we take the raw data, the lightning raw data, and we're just interested to know if there's a thunderstorm there or not. We don't really, it's not really interesting for us at the moment how much lightning is in the thunderstorm. So we divide the, the globe up into 0.15 degree boxes, about 15 by 15 kilometer resolution. And we're just looking if on a, a kind of a binary counter, if there's lightning or if there isn't lightning, giving it a one or a zero and uh, um, looking for a one hour of data. So in one hour of data, if we have any lightning anywhere on the planet, uh, in, a, in a 15 by 15 kilometer box, we count that as being part of a thunderstorm cell. And if these are linked together and there are various clustering algorithms, whether you take just the side, the top and the side boxes which are touching, or you take also the diagonal boxes, this is the four uh, CC method and here is the eight. Doesn't make that much difference, but these cluster the lightning into actual thunderstorm cells. Now, if we look at the climate data, and if we just take Africa, the resolution of the climate data is shown by these boxes. It's around about 2.5 degree resolution. And so our lightning thunderstorm resolution is much finer. And if we look at one of these climate boxes, we can see the orange pixels represent the boxes where we can detect lightning. And therefore, these are our thunderstorm clusters for this location and for this time. So in this one climate box, we have five clusters, five thunderstorms. And if we want to know how much of the area is covered by them, we can count the pixels and we have 13 pixels and we know the area of the, of the pixels. So we've then looked at some empirical relations between the actual raw thunderstorm clusters and various climate parameters like specific humidity, lifted index, and looking at the correlations pixel by pixel 
we can see here that the lifted index, which says something about the instability in the atmosphere, uh, is the, and it's a ne negative number. So the more negative the lifted in index here, shown by the yellow, the more likely we are to have thunderstorms, a correlation of negative uh, 0.8. And if we look at the actual humidity, the specific humidity, absolute humidity, we have a positive correlation. We looked at many uh, parameters, but in the end, we came back to these two. We built basically an empirical model and checked this on a different year of 2014. This is January, this is July. So here we actually have the absorb, uh, observed uh, clusters from the woolen data set for uh, January and for July. And here we have two different versions of our predicted model, our empirical model, showing the comparison between what we predict should occur on this month for thunderstorms and for thunderstorms in July and what's actually observed and a fairly good agreement. Now that we have a, a model where we can actually use the weather parameter, the climate parameters to simulate what we should see in thunderstorms, we can actually go back in time 70 years. So we have the same data from 1948 to 2016. Today we have it until 2020. And therefore we can see here in blue is the change in the number of thunderstorms over Africa from 1950 to close to uh, 2015. And the black curve shows the actual temperatures over the same region. And we see some relationship here between warmer years and more thunderstorm activity. But we see a definitely an increase in thunderstorm activity over the last 70 years with a, a more rapid increase in the 1990s. And if we simply correlate these two data sets together, we can see that uh, if this is the annual number of thunderstorm clusters, this is the area of those thunderstorm clusters. And here we have the annual mean temperature. We can see that there's some kind of a positive correlation here. Uh, you can see the correlation coefficients. And if we fit this with a curve, we get a sensitivity showing about a 40% increase in the number of thunderstorms over Africa for every one degree warming from 1950 to 2010. So this is not the change in lightning activity, it's the change in the actual number of clusters of thunderstorms over Africa. So it seems actually to be increasing faster than I'll show tomorrow about the prediction of actual lightning. And so uh, from our work, and we're expanding this to other places, it does appear that if we're looking back in time, there seems to be some significant evidence that thunderstorms have been changing in the last 50 to 70 years. Um, the casualties that we're talking about as part of this network are also obviously related to changes in population. And it, there have been dramatic increases in population in the last 50 to 70 years. And so the number of casualties and injuries is actually a combination with maybe both an increase in thunderstorms and also an increase in population. And it's very difficult to actually to separate out these two factors. Um, but both of those seem to be contributing to the increasing casualties and injuries in uh, developing countries. So with that, I'll thank you and I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Professor Price, uh, for this uh, wonderful presentation. And uh, uh, one question to you, uh, Professor Price. Uh, yes. Do we have uh, easy access for the data in uh, Woolen? Uh, well, wouldn't you have easy access if you're a host of one of the stations and I am one of the hosts. So I have access to all the data. Okay. So I can supply this data to anyone who wishes. We have data that started around about 2004, but I think it's only really useful and good from maybe 2010. Um, okay. every, the, the, the files are one day files. So every file is at one day from a specific month, specific year, and they're about 30 megabytes. So they're fairly large, but I can mm -hmm. share them with anyone. And as long as it's a collaboration between me and anyone in this network, then the data is available for free. That's, that's very good, very good. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Price. Uh, thank you again, uh, and we'll uh, meet again tomorrow. Uh, yes. Uh, now I would like to invite I would like to invite uh, Foster Lumasi, all the way from Zambia, who has been working with Lightning, and uh, uh, she has established, along with the SLNet, uh, as a member of her establishment, and uh, she has established Zambian Zambian Center of Lightning Network. So, uh, uh, Miss Lumasi, are you there?
poster. Oh. Can you hear me, Mr. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Please go ahead with your presentation. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Shama. And uh, I'd like to thank Salmi for organizing this uh, uh, this event. Oh. Um, now, and I'd like to thank you as well for inviting me to share uh, something on this um, on this event. Am I able to share the screen? Hello, Shama, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, but I can't see your screen, only your face I can see. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to share my screen. I didn't just, uh, I didn't really do a PowerPoint presentation, but I, I have put some um, points, um, some issues in, on, in point form that I, would have, that I would like to share. Sure. I'll to go to the share, the green dot and pull it up and you should, if you click that, it will take it to you, all of your windows and you can choose the window you want to share. Do you okay. see the green button? Uh, yes, I have. have actually, uh, maybe let me start again because I can't see my document. Okay. Let me see, let me open my document again. Let me, let me open my document, okay. Now, so I finished, just a moment. Right. I can share screen. Okay, I think that's it. Okay. I hope, does everybody see uh, some word documents? Yes. Yes, okay, yes, yes. Fine. Yeah, so thank you for asking me to share on this subject matter. And I'd like to believe uh, you are asking me to share about the challenges that uh, we've had at Zambia in establishing the, the Lightning Center in Zambia, because I do believe that the challenges will be different for different people, depending on the on, on your context and I mean, where you, you're coming from and the kind of environment. So I did put up a little bit of a background. Um, I don't want it to eat into my 10 minutes, but then it isn't much. Yeah, um, it all started um, with, uh, the Lightning Symposium we had for me uh, in Kathmandu, 2011. And, uh, but I think uh, um, of prime importance was the fact that uh, one of the evenings, I think we had a, we had a side meeting, uh, Professor Gomes called all the participants from Africa and we, 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 we met and we were brainstorming and thinking about how Africa could actively get involved in Lightning research uh, because, yeah, lightning was an issue in Africa and even much more of an issue in Africa uh, than any other part of the world. Yeah, so after um, that um, uh, meeting, we actually did agree that there was need to have a conference uh, for African, for African region uh, to discuss this issue. And uh, thanks to Mr. Richard, I don't know what happened in between the 2011 and the 2013, but we did have a first conference in, uh, in Kampala. And I think even a second one in Entebbe, uh, that's 2013 and uh, probably 2014. And uh, thanks to Nam and to Aconet, Professor Gomes and all who were working in the background that in 2015, we had the conference in Zambia. Um, I think that really marked, uh, that was a, a milestone uh, for Zambia. Although in 2014, we had registered um, the Center for Lightning um, Information and Research, that we were really not so visible until we had this conference because it's actually just, uh, shone a very bright light on us uh, because we, we, we could walk into any office of, you know, higher offices and they, they were able to support us and, 
I, I have indicated a little there that actually when we had the conference, we had our disaster management and mitigation unit actually sponsor the meals. And actually, let me uh, say here that I hope that my honorable director, Mr. Anderson Banda, director for uh, risk, what's this, disaster risk management from DMM, I hope he is listening in because I did invite him and he actually did um, say he was going to be available. I also did invite Mr. Silume Nyambe. I think most people would know him because we've been together from the beginning. I hope he's listening in. I, I invited two people from the private, um, uh, people we're quoting from the private um, sector. Mr. Samuel Ndoku, Director of Engineering for Samkyo Investment. And I did invite Mr. Godfrey Argon, uh, the Chief Operating Officer from Geoflat uh, PTY. So I hope uh, my people are listening in and uh, uh, this has been a very good uh, platform because I'm sure when they see this, it will be much easier for us, uh, especially as, as I can to go around and talk to them. So let me get into the subject uh, matter that I was asked to speak on, the challenges of establishment and sus sustenance of, a lightning, of lightning centers. Uh, like I said, let me submit that I'm going to speak from my experience uh, from uh, Zambia. And hopefully after that, um, I can have some uh, feedback uh, from the, the audience. I'm sure we'll get a lot of help. As you can hear, we're talking about challenges. So um, I did put them in point form to avoid beating about the bush or going round and round circles. So number one, um, Number one, I would say that the biggest challenge we have faced in uh, trying to establish this center and get it really uh, effectively running is that, um, you see, while you have the, your authorities, I, I can, when I listen to most of you, you have the authorities and the powers that be involved in your, um, in your activities and in the centers and the creation of the centers. For us, I think we've had a situation where um, just a private individual who has seen the need is trying to get the authorities um, to get involved. Uh, but of course, without much groundwork, it's been a little bit uh, of a challenge that has posed a challenge because it's um, been quite uh, difficult to convince the authorities, um, such as government and other potential supporters key stakeholders, uh, that lightning is a big challenge for the country and warrants the, the establishment of such a center uh, so that we can uh, attend to the issue adequately. Uh, but also I think, uh, like I said, we, a lot, we still need to do a lot of underground work because uh, although we have uh, collected some information here and there of lightning fatalities and injuries and damages in the country, we really don't have any um, any database um, that we can show to uh, the government or to uh, to these authorities that look these are the annual fatalities, these are the annual losses, um, so that they at least understand the they get a bigger picture and they understand the magnitude of the problem. So in the absence of that, I think it's been quite a challenge um, to convince. Uh, the authorities that we need this center and it deserves their participation and their their support. Uh, but also we generally have a lack of awareness, uh, lack of uh, true knowledge on lightning science and lightning safety at all levels of society. Uh, I think uh, most of what we know about lightning on, on in Zambia is, uh, or what people will talk about, is really very traditional. And they don't seem to think there's much science to it. And uh, therefore, that presents a challenge because then it simply means that we, we really need to educate uh, the society, we need to educate the authorities with, um, about this issue that they can know that we can actually do something about it because they understand there is a problem but i think um mostly people think yeah there is a problem but probably there's very little we can do about it or nothing because they think it's a 
it's a natural or it's, it's an act of God which uh, people cannot do anything about. And then um, on number two, I thought that uh, one of uh, the challenges also that we faced is uh, due to the fact that there's uh, generally a lack of seriousness to adhere to international standards when it comes to lighting protection for the industry and for institutions. Because when we just started, I was really hopeful uh, that um, our center would go around the, 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 the institutions and the industry and get them to adhere to the uh, to the international standards. And I, I actually I was actually hoping that was the way we could uh, make our money and maybe run our center. Uh, but alas, it hasn't been the the case. It hasn't been so easy. Uh, we've, we've, we've had meetings, we've visited the industry, we've visited institutions, and we, we could actually readily see that um, there is no adherence to international standards. But there's still, no matter how much we talk to them, I do remember uh, one time we, when, when we had uh, Professor Gomes visit Zambia as a visiting professor, uh, we invited, our center invited him with uh, the University of Zambia. Actually, when we went through the industry, I, I mean, he made every effort to explain to big companies, even like our power companies, our, our national airports, and, I mean, everywhere, where did, where did we go? And yeah, everybody received the information well, and so, yeah, we're going to do something about it. But after that, well, it just went quiet, and we tried to follow up, and it hasn't yielded much uh, fruit. So that actually leads me to the third point. There seems to be so much inertia uh, by the authorities, by key stakeholders in Zambia to act on anything. You know, like when we had the visiting professor and we did talk to these, uh, I mean, we did talk to the higher authorities, we talked to the managing directors, we talked to technical engineering teams and all that. And everybody was like, yeah, we're going to do something about it. And you were so hopeful because you thought like, oh yeah, we will do something about it tomorrow. But I mean, up until now, that we're still discussing, oh yeah, we'll get back to you. Oh yeah, we'll get back to you. And uh, so the story, goes on and that proves to be quite a push uh, for our center because uh, we're trying to rely on these people uh, to work with us as our key uh, stakeholders and this inertia tends to be quite exhausting uh, sometimes. Uh, I did um, pull an example uh, that uh, you know when we had the conference in 2015 there was an authority, a local authority I won't mention since this is being recorded and it will put on YouTube, but there was a local authority that actually did uh, uh, what's the word? Well, they did promise that they were going to, uh, they did pledge that they were going to sponsor, uh, they were going to sponsor uh, the conference to a certain amount of money. The conference came and the conference went and it took two years uh, for them to pay the money that they had pledged to, to support. I can imagine, uh, I mean, two years just to make uh, a contribution that you pledged you would uh, make, not very encouraging. So it tends to be quite exhausting. So that uh, is a challenge. And then the other challenge we have uh, in Zambia also is the fact that most of the big companies uh, actually that you would hope um, you can offer the service to, that is in order to sustain the center, are actually foreign. Oh, and, uh, okay. Hello? Uh, conclude your uh, remarks. Okay, okay. Yes, most of the, I will be concluding in a short time. I've just put uh, three more remaining. Yeah, the foreign companies normally would get the services from their own uh, countries. Um, so that robs us of the opportunity to also like, do some jobs for them. And then uh, the other one is it being, being a small uh, starting center, uh, we, it's been a little bit difficult to get um, uh, project sponsors because uh, we don't have the, we lack the, the experience that they require, you know, those uh, 
the requirements are actually too stringent uh, for us. So that has been a, a challenge. And then on the local scene, actually, there is a general unwillingness to pay for the services. We had Ministry of Health and we had the Rural Electrification Authority, we had Chikankata Hospital, uh, I mean, approach us uh, for the services. But then when we told them they had to pay, they were like, okay, we'll get back to you when we are ready. And we're still following them up. They haven't yet gotten back to us. So uh, that also has been a challenge. So uh, in conclusion, there's still a lot of work uh, to be done, but uh, we're not giving up the, the, what the, the pursuit uh, still continues. Uh, we work mainly with volunteers. Uh, volunteers are usually uh, available, but we need to get resources for them uh, to operate. So I think I've said most of the important things. I would, I would end here. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Foster, for your for sharing the experience and uh, facing all these hurdles uh, during your during the opening of establishment of uh, the center. And uh, uh, yes, of course, a uh, lot more to do and uh, way ahead to go with these things. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, uh, Mr. Richard. I, I don't think he is around, but uh, on behalf of uh, Richard, I think uh, it's Professor Marianne who is going to present about the SLNet and its uh, uh, yeah, functioning. Um, Professor Marianne? How can I get myself off? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, Richard was supposed to do this. Uh, he's traveling through Uganda. I can explain that. Can you you can see the slides now? Hopefully, I figured this out. Not yet. Okay. Not Sorry. Time. There we go. Coming okay. Up. Fine. Okay. So I'm learning my lessons. Okay, so Richard is traveling. Uh, Richard and I and Foster all met at, in Nepal at the conference in 2011 that um, Sri Ram uh, and Nam organized in Chandima. Um, and we've been working together off and on ever since. Um, we're supposed to be talking about mitigating human loss. Again, thank you to SolNet for organizing this. It turns out that International Lightning Safety Day and ACLE Net have a common catalyst. When Richard stood up to give his talk at the NAM meeting, he was almost in tears because he said there are 75 people that have been killed in Uganda uh, just in the last few months. He had no idea that it was like that. Uh, and just within a month or so before the meeting, uh, 18 children were killed and 38 injured. This is the second largest loss of life ever reported uh, in the world. The first one was in Zimbabwe back in, the larger one was in Zimbabwe back in the 70s. Okay. So as a result of this, he was so discouraged because his children are this age, you know, he could have sent his children to school and lost them uh, before the evening. Um, we spent a lot of time talking and um, he went back to Uganda with the idea he was going to act, do something about this and he did. He founded ACLE Net and he asked me to come on board shortly after that. Uh, it turns out that um, uh, it's an outgrowth of the meetings from the NAM meetings from Sri Lanka, I said Kathmandu and then uh, Entebbe and Kampala. Uh, in 2013 and 14. The mission of ACLE Net is a pan-African network of national regional centers. It's dedicated to the reduction of life and injury, uh, reduction of deaths, injuries, and property damage from lightning. Now, as um, Foster told you, it can be very discouraging. We, yes, we want to be a pan-African network. Uh, that's easier said than done. A lot easier said than done. 
Um, and just to remind you where Uganda is, it's here in Africa, Zambia is down here. Um, well, we've decided that all we can do is concentrate on really getting things going in Uganda, and then we hope to scale up for other countries. So let me show you some of the things we're doing. Okay, so what are the things you need to do to decrease human loss? You need to educate the government, you need to educate the people, and I've already discussed that with raising awareness. Lead by example and research. So let's look at how you educate the government. Well, you need to figure out what's important to the leaders. Is it votes? Is it money? Is it uh, notoriety and getting them on TV? Is it part of their mission? Or do they really have a heart for doing this and appeal to their heart? Again, use crises. When a bunch of kids get killed, it's in the newspapers, that's when you go to the, the government to and say, let's do something about this while it is at the top of their mind before the next crisis comes up. You gather data, gather partners. That's one of the problems uh, Foster's had in Zambia of getting partners to work with her. Her uh, chief mentor was killed in an auto accident just a few months after um, the center was formed in Zambia. Um, it really helps to have other people on your team that you can work with. If you don't have people, give Sri Ram a call, give me a call, give many of the leaders of this conference a call, and we will do the best we can to work with you. Um, as far as an NGO, uh, network with everybody you can. Introduce yourselves to everybody. Get introductions from the important people that you meet. Richard actually met the Minister of Disaster Preparedness, I think at a church function, and got to be friends with him, and he has really cleared the way for us in many directions. Okay, so when we um, thought about uh, Uganda back in 2011, it was kind of like, well, gathering data. Let's see how many news reports there are of lightning injuries. Oh, well, we came up with a bunch of them. Well, maybe that was just 2011. So we looked at 2019 and we found, you know, we've been looking at it every year since then. This is the number of injuries and deaths uh, reported in 2019, okay? On the ACLE Net website, we are now collecting data uh, and collecting news reports from 31 countries of the 55 countries in Africa. If you want to find this, if you've got your uh, laptop tuned up, you can go to the aclenet.org website, go to the tab that's news, and then pull down an injury reports by year and country. You'll find all of the different countries we're collecting data on. This is the largest database on lightning injuries uh, in more countries than probably any place in the world. Certainly for Africa, it is. And it's all free. Um, you can print off every one of the news reports. You can um, do data, data analysis on it, whatever you'd like to do. Uh, and we'll be happy to help you with that. Okay, well, one of the other things that the government may be worried about, in addition to loss of life, is economic loss. You may be able to um, work with the government and say, look, you're having too much damage. Uh, too many of our people are out of electricity when the uh, nodes are down. Um, and point out damage to equipment, utility systems, all of the things that are important to the economy. Often the repairs are delayed in developing countries because of spare parts, remote locations. And don't forget the downtime, not only downtime to the businesses, but to all of the people who have sp food spoilage and, and uh, don't have lights anymore because of the electricity. Um, replacement of lost and corrupted data in businesses and banks and things like that, tremendous. So you may be able to appeal to your government on an economic basis. Uh, yeah, we're supposed to be talking about human loss of life, but don't forget that families, uh, particularly in Africa, still have a majority of their wealth uh, often in animals, and you can see the kind of damage that happens with lightning in animals. Well, it turns out that the economic impact of governments is that there, it's, it can be tremendous, and they're already challenged by so many other things. If we can remove lightning from that mix, then they can spend more time looking at the other problems that they're having. Okay, lead by example. Well, how do you do this? Uh, pick high community impact programs and projects. 
uh, again, deal, work with crises, talk with the TVs and the media and things like that. Uh, high visibility projects. When we do a lightning protection um, uh, program uh, or when we protect the school, we have a big commissioning celebration. and We hire a TV uh, broadcaster to come in and tape it and we put it up on our YouTube channel and we get sure that it, we get media coverage uh, all over the country uh, to raise awareness. And we've ch chosen to protect the most vulnerable. In Africa, 90% of sub-Saharan dwellings are not lightning safe. They're made up of mud brick with roofs of thatch or sheet metal uh, out in the villages. So that families, farmers, everybody is at risk 24 seven. They have no, safe that's, no place that's safe for them to go. Well, we can't protect individual homes. I mean, nobody's gonna fund that, but we can uh, look at the more vulnerable. If you remember these kids up at Ranyanya, back in about 2013, 2014, we did a survey, just looked, just looked at the news reports that we could easily get to, and we found school, 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 school. Well, schools are a great place to uh, protect. First of all, the entire community is impacted when a school is hit, not just one family. So you can really have a community impact. Uh, schools also tend to be the most substantial buildings in most villages, so they're easier to protect than a uh, thatch uh, area or uh, some other community buildings. Schools tend to be community centers. One school we protected, we couldn't even work on Sunday because every classroom had a different church meeting in it. Um, it's a great place to do education from. And frankly, um, as a nonprofit in Africa, talking about kids being killed by lightning is a lot more likely to get us money for our projects than uh, talking about um, communities that are impacted. These are the schools that we've protected so far in Africa, uh, is, excuse me, in Uganda. You can see that we've tried to pick them around the country. We've still got a couple holes down in the south uh, area, up in the northeast area that we want to protect some other schools. We're going to be using these as educational centers for hands-on education of engineers, installers, and things like that. Um, uh, part of the design for this, we formed a lightning protection working group that's made up of world-class lightning protection people. Uh, they serve on the international co code committees. They're all volunteers. We've been working together since 2018, meeting every week for an hour, hour and a half, two hours, and they work a lot on their own doing designs too. We're addressing lightning protection problems that no one else has ever looked at uh, for these schools, for uh, the teacher homes that are there. We're trying to figure out what local materials we can use so we don't have to import and pay the customs fee so we can protect more schools because we've got more money. Uh, and we're also at the point where we're starting to make templates that can be easy, easily adapted to other schools throughout Uganda. And then hopefully, uh, this is, you know, three, five, 10 year plan, we scale up across Africa and maybe Asia and other countries, okay? One of the results of our work and the publicity we've done is a memo of understanding between ACLE NET, the Ministry of Education, and as I said, the Minister of Disaster Preparedness is a buddy of Richard's from church or, or somewhere like that. He's a great guy. He's the one that really got this push through. The memo of understanding is to protect schools throughout Uganda. So we're finally recognized as um, doing some of the things that the Ministry of Education wishes they could do. We're gonna be consulting with them on that. Do public education teacher, parent, student education, and uh, we hope to be doing the um, education of professionals as well, like many of you are doing. Okay, some of the other things we hope to do in the future, warning systems, phone apps, uh, using lightning detection and actually getting out to the people, uh, making uh, forecasts accessible to the public. Many of the countries in Africa only do forecasting for the airport because that's where commerce is done. Uh, the forecasts are not available to the general public at all. We need to change that, okay? Or well, research too, don't forget that. We have a whole group of international experts in lightning uh, protection, lightning uh, research, atmospheric research. 
um, and we want to investigate. Does it make a difference if um, the kids wear shoes? Uh, I never recommend this in the United States. It doesn't make a difference because we've got all of these buildings and safe areas people can go to. But does wearing something on their feet or sleeping on an elevated uh, bed or anything like that decrease at least a percentage of the injuries? Uh, several people are helping us with that. How do we protect small buildings and boats? Uh, Chandima is working on that. So we've got all kinds of ideas of things that we're doing. And last but not least, talk to anyone who will listen. Keep talking about this. You never know when you're going to find somebody who's going to say, as somebody did to me about three years ago. I'm married to a, a woman and her mother uh, are part of both of a big family foundation. And with your permission, I'd like to go home and nominate ACLE Net for a $100,000 grant. And would that be OK? Yes, it's OK. OK, that's how we protected some of those schools. So talk to anybody. You never know who's going to come up and uh, help you. And thank you. This is what happened. Ranyanya was the first school that we protected. That's the one that had the injuries back in 2011. The uh, head teacher wrote us this um, testimonial about uh, a year and a half ago. And they're now up to nearly 1,000 students because the children feel safe there. The families feel safe there, feel safe sending their kids. In Uganda, the first thing that happens when a thunderstorm comes over is the children scatter. They leave school. They run home. They can't get an education that way. They can get an education if we can make the school safe enough for them. So we hope uh, this is what we're doing in Uganda. We hope to spread it across Africa, but that's going to take a while. We know that one step at a time. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Marian, uh, for your uh, wonderful presentation and uh, what you have been doing in Uganda along with your colleagues uh, down there. Uh, thank you much uh, for uh, uh, guidance to go ahead with seen uh, so many people and uh, prominent figures in the in the screen and uh, of course uh, we don't have much time to uh, uh, spare uh, or share uh, get uh, get their ideas shared today but we'll hear from them tomorrow as well but at the same time i would like to uh, invite uh, if he wishes to um, mr man thapa who has been working for ADPC, uh, Asian Disaster Preparedness Center, uh, Bangkok, uh, and, and the representative of Nepal, of lightning up, is a major issue in this uh, part of the world. So he has been conducting so many uh, training programs on behalf of uh, ADPC. Uh, Mr. Thapa, would you like to share some, uh, although you have, uh, you'll be speaking tomorrow, but uh, if you want to say, share something at this moment before I move on to the last presentation of Professor Chandima Gomes, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Man Thapa. Um, thank you, uh, Sri Ram, sir, uh, for inviting me um, in this very interesting uh, you, discussion. And uh, definitely, I will speak more on uh, the initiative that we uh, jointly undertook in Nepal um, during my presentation tomorrow. But um, I really appreciate um, the initiative that you have undertaken to bring all these um, uh, practitioners and professionals together in this very interesting uh, issue, topics which has been always ignored in our part of the world despite of the uh, large number of people that has been killed annually by lightning. And I think a very basic um, um, awareness raising activity that um, I just heard from different colleagues uh, could save life um, in Nepal as well as compared to other, other parts of the world. So I'll definitely speak more or share more what we have been doing together in Nepal in my presentation tomorrow. And thank you and all the best, uh, Professor Sri Ram Sarva. Thank you so much, Mansa. Uh, now, again, uh, what I see is uh, uh, Dr. Rajendra Man Sresta, a uh, uh, member of Provincial Council uh, in, in uh, State 3, uh, Province 3 of Nepal. Uh, Dr. Sresta, would you like to share something uh, before we 
conclude uh, uh, we, we we present the concluding presentation dr rajendraman shrestha are you there yes i am here sir okay uh, would you like to share something because you have been taking initiatives to aware uh, the people in this uh, uh, province so would you like to share something about it actually i am uh, learning some important instance programs from all wide i am trying to convince my provincial government to initiate programs for protection of human life but it's not succeed it so how could i convince my government is my problem so i would like to not sharing i would like to get uh I'm getting some points from other presentations, so I will like to uh, share a little more tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you so much for being with us all through the presentations and the meeting. Uh, now, finally, I would like to invite Professor Sandima Gomez, all the way from South Africa. Uh, uh he has been uh, actually he has been an uh, architect of all these centers and awareness campaigns and all these things and in, uh, real inspirer so um, i have been uh, very much inspired by him and uh, the, the formation of solnet is uh, because of him so i would like to welcome and invite professor sandima professor sandima are you there yeah sure i'm here shri thank you very much and uh, and uh, welcome again okay so hope that you can hear me i will share my screen yeah we can hear you you just share it okay uh, let me share the screen yeah can you see the screen now Yes, yes it is it is yeah. okay it's a, it's a quite a short presentation and uh, it, actually uh, i'm making the same presentation uh, today and tomorrow so today i will do a, uh, a small part and then uh, continue it to uh, tomorrow and uh, but so uh, i thought of uh, giving you a very brief idea about uh, what what these centers are their objectives and how we move forward this is actually a rare occasion that i am not talking about technical matters on lightning but i really enjoy uh, telling you about my experience and uh, also what i have seen in the world as uh, we were uh, going through with this uh, centers and uh, just to give you a very brief idea about uh, this center business uh, actually in in 2004 uh, i received uh, together with dr munir ahmed and uh, mr parshuram sharma from uh, uh, bhutan a usa grant to promote lightning uh, safety and protection in the south asian region and so that we have conducted a number of programs uh, and as a result uh, munir uh, in bangladesh uh, started a lightning center that was the first lightning center we have came up with 
and uh, we were also having discussion initiations to start a lighting center in Bhutan. And uh, then in the next couple of years, we had uh, a lot of uh, discussions uh, in the Indian uh, subcontinent and uh, we, we conducted few programs in, uh, uh, in India, in Guwahati, then we started uh, a center in Guwahati, then uh, another one in uh, Cochin. I think uh, this Cochin center was what uh, finally uh, bloomed as the CESA uh, Lightning Center. Uh, with the patronage of uh, Mr. Gopakuma. And uh, in the same time, in 2006, uh, I tried to uh, establish another lightning center in Pakistan, in Islamabad. But uh, we, we started a group, a research group, uh, but uh, it did not bloom into a, a research uh, a lightning center. Still, um, keep on uh, struggling to form it there. And uh, at the same time, from year 2000 to year 2009, this is my biggest disappointment in the life. I tried my best to uh, come up with a lightning research center in Sri Lanka, my mother country. I had a big proposal. I had bodies which were which agreed to uh, provide some grants and and all the infrastructure was there but there was no place to start this and uh, then in 2008 uh, i found that malaysians were very much interested in forming this my my virtual uh, lightning center so in 2009 i shifted to Malaysia. I settled down there. We started this Center of Excellence on Lightning Protection, which bloomed to one of the best uh, international centers in the world. We, uh, by the time we, uh, e e e uh, during the golden time of this, we were producing like 40 research papers in uh, high impact factor journals uh, through this center uh, per year. And uh, uh, we were mostly on research, but uh, we, we have done a lot on policy development, uh, safety promotion, and so on. So, and in 2011, I think the, the rest of the story was covered by uh, many others. We had a very decisive uh, NAM Center triggered uh, program in Nepal under the leadership of uh, Sri Ram Sharma, during which we decided that uh, the next focus should be Africa. And at that time, I didn't have even in my wildest dreams to move myself to Africa, but uh, it went on very well. And then uh, with the exhaustive efforts of uh, Mr. Richard, Tushmarewe, I never pronounce his name correctly, uh, and uh, Professor Marianne Cooper, uh, it bloomed like nothing. I'm, I'm so happy and proud of uh, this institute. And then we were trying to uh, have the centers in Zambia. Foster is doing her level best to make it uh, uh, prosper and uh, then we are having uh, some ideas of uh, establishing centers in other African countries as, as well and at the same time in 2016 we had another conference in uh, Colombia and uh, was planning to come up with a center there it, it came up it came up but uh, going going forward very slowly so, so this is what's happening in the developing world during the last 20 years. And uh, with that, in this presentation, I'm going to tell you, if somebody is intending to start 
a lightning center, what should he or she uh, got to look at? Now, first of all, when we talk about lightning centers, we should know that what do we expect from a lightning center? Let's go one by one. And this is very important thing. One of the major concerns or objectives of a lightning center, in my point of view, is generation of income and achievement of personal and team goals. And this is the reality. I mean, if, if somebody says that I'm doing it totally because of uh, the self-satisfaction or the charity, yes, it can be, but, but I'm sure that in, in real sense, everybody has their own personal goals. That's not bad. I think that is what drives a center uh, forward. And uh, so keep in mind that a lightning center, I'm emphasizing this, need not be a charity organization. Select your model at the earliest stage. It can be a business model. It can be a charity model. It can be an NGO. It can be a non-profit earning but income generating organization. And you may change that model later, but, but this is very important that when you're starting a center, make sure that uh, it has a, a well-defined focus and you should know why I'm starting this center. And then how do we generate income? How do we achieve our personal goals? There comes the second. Reduce lightning accidents in a target region by public awareness, providing safe shelters on lightning protection measures. This is what ACLINET did during the last two, three years. They, they provided lightning protection uh, systems to several schools. I mean, this is uh, one of the first time in the world that such novel work has been done in the field of lightning safety and lightning lightning protection then implementing appropriate policies which can reduce curb the lightning accidents and also the third one is to reduce property damage in a target region how do you reduce damage as a center in a target region you can train engineers and technicians promote standards and guidelines, promote the adoption of correct lightning protection measures. As Mr. Gopakuma pointed out, now one of the biggest challenges we have in the whole world, not only in developing countries, in the whole world, is that there are so many fraudulent lightning protection systems which are sometimes totally rejected by the standards, sometimes which are not recommended by the standards, but they, are, they have invaded the market and they are, they are making a havoc in the world. In Malaysia, for an example, we see that 75%, over 75% of the lightning protection systems are not according to either IEC standards all the Malaysian national standards. We have been fighting for the for my last 10 years, uh, from 2010 to 2020, I have been fighting with my colleagues in, in a losing battle, to be very honest with you, to, to make these countries adapting the scientifically proven technologies. But, but Unfortunately, we are, we are not at the winning side. Then increasing the scientific knowledge, conducting research, sharing facilities and resources, dis disseminating knowledge and so on. So these are the four basic expectations, objectives or goals of forming a lightning research center. Oh, sorry, a lightning center. And then somebody might ask, what can we do by a lightning center? And I think I will stop with this slide. 
uh, lightning center can be a lightning research center, lightning awareness center, lightning training center, or just a lightning center. But a lightning center can do various tasks. Basically, public awareness, research, training, and services. And public awareness, now you can see that how many things that a lightning center can do. Don't forget that these things you can do by getting funds from somewhere and doing it free of charge to the public. Or you can even do this for a certain amount of fee so that it can be an income generation as well as service providing task. And uh, so I'm not going through each of these one by one. So you will see that public awareness you can do in various ways. Now I'll take only one uh, under this, this communication apps. Now in African continent, I think Acclinet uh, uh, pioneered in this case as well. Uh, they are trying to implement a phone app where the lightning detection system data will be sent to the phone. So this is very important in the case of the fisheries communities, especially in countries like uh, Uganda, uh, where the Lake Victoria is having a big chunk. If Lake Victoria is bordering uh, several countries. And this is a huge one. It's beautiful, wonderful. And we, uh, I I'm sure that few of the colleagues attending this, this uh, event can remember one of the wonderful night trips we had in uh, the Lake Victoria uh, on a on a scary uh, night, it, it, but it was a wonderful experience. And uh, the people do fishing in this in this region, especially in the in this type of large lakes, they are being. Uh, affected by the lightning activities very much and they have no way to avoid this unless they get a message at least half an hour in advance that there is a thunderstorm approaching. And likewise, we have research, training, services, especially the training and services, we can have income generation. Uh, well, I'm sorry that I don't have time to go each one, uh, one by one, but uh, each item here is very important and it gives you an idea what we can do through the Lightning Center while providing a service. It can also generate income for your survival. It is both ways beneficial, benefit to the community as well as to you. And I'll take one more to end up the presentation. If you go through the training, number four, entrepreneurs. This is one of my major uh, activities uh, at present, training the people to come out with or come up with their own entrepreneurship. For an example, you can select, say three people with little bit of technical knowledge in a given village or in a given area, and then train them, conduct a workshop for them to train them on lightning protection with very simple methods cost-effective material and methodologies, and then let them start a small business. Maybe you can talk to a, a, a regional or national bank and get a loan for them. Because we, if you are a good lightning research center, you will develop a, a reputation. So you, you can influence the banking sector and then uh, they can uh, give him a, a loan by which uh, it can be supported. 
so at this point i will stop my presentation and uh, uh, tomorrow i will continue from there thank you very much thank you professor sanima for this uh, uh, wonderful presentation and uh, telling us about uh, what a center can do uh, we hope that uh, we'll do such things in the days uh, ahead uh, we have uh, uh, a growing center so we'll do so and uh, uh, now what i see is uh, we don't have many questions uh, i had seen a couple of questions but uh, that uh, basically was uh, uh, to uh, professor Colin Price, but he has uh, another meeting. He has already left, so we can again uh, discuss with him these questions tomorrow as well. Uh, I think uh, during his presentation, most of the things uh, that uh, I have seen as a question have already been uh, addressed. So I don't think there are many questions left. So I would like to thank uh, all of you for your time, patience, and. Uh, uh, I hope uh, we'll interact uh, tomorrow. Uh, and uh, I again request you all to be in time tomorrow and uh, all the speakers are requested to make uh, their presentations as uh, uh, much uh, as, as per the time schedule that uh, is given to every speaker so that uh, others cannot, uh, uh, will, not be, will not have to wait uh, for uh, longer. Uh, I think uh, this is all I would like to uh, say good night from my side. If you have anything, Marian or Chandima, you can just uh, share your words. Marian, do you have anything to share with? Uh, we have been recording uh, all of the sessions. I apologize to Sri, I didn't uh, re get the recording turned on for his introduction, but uh, we have someone who's going to be editing these and putting them into sections for experts versus um, um, other uh, groups like from the disaster uh, groups and uh, post them to YouTube so that we have a beginning resource library. Uh, and I hope that we will continue this work uh, just as the US has been doing this for 20 years. I hope today is only the beginning of uh, international lightning safety uh, work. Um, so thank you to everyone for participating. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, Nima, do you have uh, to say anything about uh, the ILDS lightning safety? Uh, yes, I, I think Sri, we, are to, we, we can uh, discuss about that tomorrow. Uh, okay. Because today I think uh, people are a little fed up by now. Uh, so that we will take it up because that's a very important uh, issue and important point uh, for this event. So I think we better take it afresh tomorrow. Yeah, sure, sure. Then I thank all the participants, speakers and everybody. Uh, and I look forward to see you tomorrow. For now, I would say uh, good night and have a good time uh, at uh, your part of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Good, Good morning from here. Thank you. Thank you, Shreya. Thank, Thank you very much. Good evening. Good night. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. -bye. Good morning. Bye. Good night. Good night. Okay, good night, friends. <laughs>